Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second ever episode of the Outcomes Podcast, where we interview entrepreneurs about what outcomes matter the most to them in life. Today, I have a real treat for you, Sean Clark, the CEO and co-founder of High Level, or Go High Level, as many people like to call it. High Level is a super unique software product built for digital marketing agencies and small business owners, which I use every single day. It's absolutely exploding right now. And it's really cool to hear from Sean in this podcast about his work-life balance, what outcomes matter the most to him in his personal life and for the customers of High Level, and a few other questions I haven't heard him asked anywhere else. So enjoy. Before we get to the podcast, though, I do want to fill you in on my affiliate offer for High Level. If you're trying to start an agency, this is perfect for you. The link is below, and the video right after this will explain what's included. High Level is the top all-in-one sales and marketing solution for anyone running a marketing agency. It gives you all the software you need to capture, nurture, and close leads for marketing clients. And the best part is High Level believes in not taxing the agencies on its platform so you can get unlimited clients for one low monthly fee. The best features include a CRM, funnel, website, and email builders, course hosting, robust marketing automations, a consolidated chat stream for email, SMS, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Instagram DMs, reputation management, social media posting, and so much more. And as if that wasn't enough, High Level is fully white labeled. This means that you can brand the desktop and mobile apps with your logo and company colors and resell it to your industry for whatever price you decide. Essentially, High Level has brought the bar for starting your own marketing software way lower so normal people like you and me can help our clients with their own software without paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in development costs. I am absolutely not kidding when I say High Level is hands down my favorite software of all time. I use it absolutely every single day and it's been integral to my success with my agency, helping increase my clients' results and their retention. And if you sign up today with my link, not only will you get a free trial to the software, but you'll also get access to my weekly coaching calls for my High Level affiliates, teaching you how to use the software and run your agency, as well as templates that I have for the marketing automations and funnels and websites inside of the software and an affiliates only community on Discord. To get all of that and more, just click the link below this video. How's 2023 treating you so far, Sean? So far, so good, man. So I want to get like a quick backstory of you and High Level. I know there was okay. a lot that happened before High Level, but let's hear the, the High Level origin story. Sure. Yeah. So that's pretty simple. So I had another SaaS company that I was already running. Mm -hmm. And it was basically in the accounting space, helping small businesses get paid on their invoices. I asked them like, hey, what do you want more of? And they said, oh, I want more customers. And so I sort of thought, okay, well, maybe I can do that, right? So I, I hooked up with my friend Varun and we sort of wrote High Level 1.0. And the idea there was just reputation management plus two-way texting. And so we brought that out. And at first people were like really thrilled and they loved the demo and all that. And then they started, but I like two weeks would go by and they like started canceling on me, which I didn't take very kindly to. And so I'd be like, you know, what the heck is wrong with you? They'd be like, oh, we love the software. It's great. It's just, we don't have time to learn it. And so it was kind of one of this like pinnacle moments, like, oh crap. So like we've done something they tell us is good, but they say they just don't have time to like run their business and implement this. So what do we do? Right. And so that's when we got a call from a marketing agency actually and they said, hey, we have this co-customer comment. I remember it was like, it was like a hydro pros or something, like some place okay. where they inject you with needles and put stuff in your body. I would never let anybody do, but whatever. And they were like, hey, we would like to see what you're doing for our client. And I still remember thinking, God, you know, why should I get on the phone with this idiot? He's not even paying me. I don't get it. But I was like, whatever. He seems like a nice dude. Let's do it. We got nothing else going on. So it turns out, right, is what we learned from that call is a couple of things. So A, he loved what we were doing and gave us a lot of great advice. And two weeks went by and he was still around. He bought it for all of his other clients, which was like 80 at the time, which was really cool. He introduced us to like 13 other agencies and one of which brought us down for our very first mastermind where we sold the whole room of 40 some agencies. And what it, all of that experience came together to really teach us was, gosh, you know, it's not about the hydro pros or the, you know, plumber or whatever. It's about the agency that's serving them. And so that's what really made us say, you know, forget this selling to small business nonsense. Let's go talk to agencies because they're really the people behind the scenes making the magic happen. Very cool. So you noticed that the agencies understood it and had the marketing know-how to really implement it, whereas the small business owner didn't. Well, and also act, if you looked at the businesses that were being successful, they by and large had agencies, right? Mm -hmm. Or someone that they worked with who is serving in that capacity. Essentially, you know, I think what had, you know, when you're thinking about software, you're thinking about something that somehow automates 
and magically does stuff. But in reality, it's just a tool like a lot of other tools. And as it becomes sufficiently complex, you really need an expert to be able to use it, right? And so mm -hmm. agencies had already been serving that role. And so it just really taught us like, okay, people who are being successful use agencies, people who aren't are not as being as successful. And we really want to see this technology go someplace. We really want to build a lot more of it. How in the world are we ever going to do that with SMBs? Like we can't, right? So that's yeah. where we realized agencies were the right answer. And when you started high level, how big did you want it to be? Oh, I mean, I, I never thought it would, in my wildest dreams would get this big. So mm. I guess less than it is now. Okay. Because Invoice Sherpa, that's the name of your your first yeah. software company, right? How big, like customers wise, were you before a you started? Thousand, a thousand customers, but those are actually pretty respectable numbers, but they uh, offer very low, <laughs> low monthly fee, which was the big mistake I made in that business was... I priced it way too cheaply. Um, it's the number one mistake I made in that business. And I ended up being the only employee for a very good, for a very, very, very bad reason, which is I didn't charge enough. You know, I would go around and people think, oh, that's so cool. And I'm like, like that's so stupid. Um, that yeah. just means you don't charge enough money. And so it was a, it was miserable uh, near the end because I was just, I couldn't even program anymore because I was just spending all my time on customer support tickets, basically answering the same question a thousand times over because I just hadn't created a scalable model. Got it. So you start high level and maybe you're thinking, okay, similar size to invoice Sherpa, or maybe hopefully it'll get bigger someday, but you're yeah, passionate much, about much helping. Much bigger, I, I hoped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but you're passionate about helping small businesses. That was the Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had been helping small businesses with technology my whole life. And I just thought this was another, a bigger version of that, I guess, than cool. what I was already doing. Cool. And so fast forward a few years, you got a pretty big offer from a private equity firm to just depart from high level, right? And and sell uh, a company. private company, actually, public, well, okay. actually publicly, publicly traded company. <laughs> wow. And tell us yeah. about that experience. So this was two years ago now, I guess. So so we were doing great. We, we didn't need any money. We were profitable. But I really wanted to understand, A, how does the world really work? And it's hard to it's hard to know by just, you know, you read online and, you know, you don't really know what you don't know until you try it. And so yeah. there was that aspect of it. And then the other thing was like, well, I really want to do something really big here. And what would that look like? And who would we need to help us? And as we started talking to these folks, it just sort of became apparent that you could get more than money, which sounds weird, but you know, you could get a lot of expertise, particularly with the right partners. And I think this is where this journey was took a twist that I didn't expect, which is hmm. I sort of thought these people would have money and sure enough, they all show up with that. But that's not really what defines them. It's ultimately what can they do beyond that? And so I think we started with a field of like something crazy, 200 or something people, and we whittled it down to two. And at the end of the day, you know, one was a full buyout from a public company, which was really exciting. But also like a big deal. And then the other was a was a minority interest from a PE company who had a lot of operating partners uh, that would come in and help us. And so when it was all said and done, I just tried to choose the one that I felt like best fit our culture. And I felt like at least with the minority interest, I wouldn't lose control. And so as a result, if it was like a stupid mistake on my part, like, you know, they'd be on the cap table, but they couldn't push us around. Mm. Uh, now, of course, retrospectively, that was a really smart move because they turned out to be really everything they said they were going to be, which is really smart, smart people on the finance side, but it, even more importantly to us, really smart people on the operations side. So they gave us a lot of really critical, like jump forward kind of moves that I personally would have never done. And some, a lot of which put me outside of my comfort zone when they told me, but ultimately, you know, now a year later, I can totally see why that was genius and how it's helped us continue to grow quite rapidly. Got it. And what was the number on the, the full buyout, if you can say? 300 million at the time. Wow. And saying no to that, a, a number that would allow you to just live forever and not really have to do anything. Why choose continue to, to run the business over sipping I mean, the plot is on the beach? Uh, there was a lot of confusion around our business model and why we were being successful and a lot of mm -hmm. disbelief, I think. And I was concerned that as, if that was how it was during the dating period, you know, imagine what marriage would look like. And yeah. so I wasn't worried about myself. I would have, you know, I probably would have had to suffer through a couple of years of nonsense over it, but I was really concerned about the change that would rapidly come to my customers. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of felt 
like it wasn't fair to them. We're here because our customers believe in us. And without that belief, you know, it, it, we don't exist. And so given that I had gotten so much faith from so many others, I just felt like it was wrong to just sort of take the easy route. Although, I, I mean, I would say it wasn't really easy to get there, but I just felt like I was really leaving a lot of people in the dark and I, I just felt wrong about it. I don't know. It just didn't check with my ethics. And so I felt like, you know, I would never ever want someone to do that to me. So why would I do that to them? And that was that simple. Got it. So at this point, you're running a, a very big company, tons of employees, like rapid growth. What does a day in the life look like for you? A lot of calls with a lot of customers, which is what I prefer. And I don't prefer, but I see the value in. Okay. Um, the biggest lesson I learned is the things that you that you are really good at all of a sudden start to rapidly run out of gas. And it's like this twofold letdown because on one hand, it's probably a letdown because you're good at it because you're used to it. And then it's probably a letdown because they are no longer as effective as tools as they once were. And so you, you sort of have this double failure of your previous paradigm that you have to rapidly change. It's not easy to do, but when you do it, I mean, sort of like you go through this initial period of like, this sucks and nothing appears to be working. But then slowly over time, people start to pick up and you get to watch other people at scale, maybe do some of the things that you used to do. And because there's 20 of them, they can do a lot more of it than you did. And so I think that's kind of the magical thing to see. Got it. And that's what you mean by you see the value in the employee meetings, even though maybe you'd rather be doing it yourself or, or taking much, it. much rather, or just not meeting with anyone that <laughs> isn't a customer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've never considered myself a coach or a teacher or a, even a good manager for that matter. I just like digging in and getting things done. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you got to realize that like the job changes, it's not about you getting things done. It's about you helping other people get things done. And, yeah. and, and that is a very different mode of operation for sure. Got it. Have you read The Motive by Pat Lencioni? No, because no. I don't have a lot of time to read. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Exactly the same point. Like being a CEO is having tough conversations with people all day. Yeah. Um, you hear from people when things are wrong. That's your, yeah. whether they're employees or customers, your whole job is to hear bad news all day and figure out wh what are that bad news is just people sort of complaining because they're like, because they can, or what is systemic and you need to follow up on and, and get to the root cause of and find that, you know, there are resources that didn't get put in place that should have and sort of, fix, and, you know, and talk to the manager who should have done that and kind of follow mm -hmm. that all the way through. So it's, there's a lot of, a lot of that. Cool. And when you say meetings with your customers, are you just like getting on support calls or hanging out in the Facebook group to see what people are complaining about? Or oh, <laughs> all of the above. I haven't changed and I, I don't anticipate changing ever is my willingness to get on calls with people. You know, it's really important to me that I'm effective. And I guess what I try to do more than anything now is redirect people to better resources. And what's kind of cool actually is there are many scenarios now that come to me where I can think of someone who's superior at solving the problem that I, mm. and then I even am. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool in that sense, right? Like where it's like, well, I could get on the phone with you, but I actually don't know as much as this other person. So let me get you to that person. But there's certainly still calls though that I get on or that I, where I talk to people who have like deeper issues, philosophical issues, structural issues, strategic issues, that kind of thing, less bug fix issues. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely, that's kind of my day. Got it. And is it like these customers are just reaching out to you directly or they're reaching out to somebody Yeah, there are people hitting me up on Facebook, a messenger <laughs> or still have me on Slack or where, or some people I got, a, I got a text from a guy today randomly. So it just all depends. And you're just hopping on and help like giving them career advice or, 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 or just solving problems. Some guy today, he, you know, he was like, Oh my God, why did this email go out to the blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, cause you put your customer as an agency admin, but <laughs> why don't you get on the success zoom room and uh, they can help you fix that problem. Right. So even stuff like that. <laughs> That is so funny that someone texts you. That's amazing. Well, I called him and I'm not sure he'll text me again. I was pretty abrupt and direct with him. I was like, you know, yeah. He's like, well, does this happen often? I'm like, yes, people do screw stuff up all the time. <laughs> I said, but you know, what's great is we've got the Zoom room and we have these people and they will help you through it. So why yeah. don't you jump on? And honestly, that's a great example though, of where those people will help him more because it's not just that one issue he has. How did he get there? And you know, what, what other skills do we need to teach him so that he can, because he was, he started going in like, well, you know, what is this guy going to think when I explain it to him? And I'm like, I don't know what some guy's going to think when you <laughs> explain something to him. Like, just tell him, you know, ghost in the machine or whatever, right? Like Twitter goes yeah. down, Facebook goes down. Like your car sometimes doesn't start. Like, I don't know, just do your best. I love it.
So all of this said, you have this amazing company that you're running, but you also have a family. Do you believe in work, work-life balance? What does that look like for you? Oh, way more today than I used to. I think relationships are something that is interesting. I, I mean, there's though for all people, there will come a day when they are, no matter how amazing they were at some point, they will be forgotten, myself included. And so when those days are over, the relationships you will have are the ones that you cultivated with the people that knew you before you were <laughs> somehow amazing and and after you are no longer are amazing. And so I think it's important to spend time with those people. And, and in particular, I think it's awesome to build things and to do things. But I mean, I, I still, still think it's awesome to have, you know, fun with your family um, and do things that you enjoy. So I certainly try to do a good job with that. I don't think I'm successful at it, but I think it's certainly something that I think is important. Got it. And what does that look like right now? Like what time do you start work? What time do you end work? How often do you go on vacation? I start work at six in the morning. Generally, I, I wake up at, I have to sort of vegetate for 30 minutes to come online, but then I start work at six. I'm generally off work by, well, off work is a very interesting term. I would mm. say I'm never off work. I'm off scheduled calls by three so mm. that I can start winding down any direct messages I missed or Facebook posts or follow-ups or just urgent issues. And that can last anywhere between you know one to two hours. And then I just sort of monitor things constantly until I go to sleep and try to fit family in kind of in the middle. So it's not really funny. I was at my son's soccer game last night and some guy looked at me and he's like, yeah, I was on my phone answering some Facebook message. And he was like, you're never off, are you? And I'm like, well, no, you can't really be off. Like it's not a thing. So yeah, I would say vacations are pretty rare because again, it starts to sort of, I mean, we definitely go on vacation probably two or three times a year, but it's smaller trips. It's still not being off. You know, it's, you know, I went to, um, what is it? Universal Studios or whatever, you know, and it's, it's checking messages between rides or yeah. while in the line or whatever. So, you know, I, that's not really most people's idea of a vacation. So it's a little different. Got it. How sustainable do you think that is? Do you think this period will last forever? Well, I mean, it's a lot better than it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So this is another great thing about hiring super great people and yeah. getting them online. I mean, I think it gets better every day, but at some point you have to like know who you are. Right. So like, this isn't like me being held over, you know, the fire sort of mercilessly by others. This is just mm. as much my doing as anyone's. I am this person. I like running a business this way. I want to be connected with my customers. I care about their success. I, you know, in, in their darkest hour, I don't want to be some, you know, absent figure. And so it's just tough not to, to be like that. So, so do I think we'll get better? sure um, to the extent that I get better but, but it's very important to me I guess that as I is I am less available that doesn't mean they get less help and so I won't change things until I see that that fundamentally change and I will say I've ch the, the reason I've changed it to this degree so far is because I've seen a lot of improvement in all things support onboarding customer success you know dev releases everything so things have gotten yeah. a lot better so you're the glue until you don't need to be I think that's the way to be I mean I I sort of think of myself as the customer advocate within the company, right? So okay. I look at what people say and I try to see how they it makes them, how it impacts them, right? Like what feelings, because I think a lot of times you have really well-intentioned people on both sides of the line. But invariably, what happens is there's going to be misunderstandings one way or another. And it's on both sides. Sometimes customers get radically too dramatic, <laughs> And sometimes product managers miss really meaningful, you know, business processes that in the things that they develop. And you have to have someone who can translate between the two. And so that's what I focus most of my time on. Got it. Smart. What outcome would you say matters most to you when it comes to the customers of high level? Are they making money? Are they able to achieve? Because I think that that is a good stand in, at least as far as I am in their lives to whether or not they're being able to create meaningful success for themselves. Because I really got into this to help the small businesses. And I think I know our product does that. So when well implemented, our product rocks that. But it, we'll see it because the agency will make money and we will see their business models improve. We'll see their recurring revenues go up. We'll see their profitability go up. So if they're being successful, I'm being successful. That's really all, all, all there is to it. Got it. And what about you personally? What outcome matters the most to you in life? Um, you know, I think the product that we continue to build continues to serve that mission and continues to get 
wide, spread wider. Because one of the things I will say that, you know, while it's technically a software company, I would say that the biggest thing that we have done is create a different business model. Mm -hmm. And that business model was, well, in fact, let me take that back. We didn't create it. We stole it, but we stole it from the right people. We stole it from our customers. And so mm -hmm. we literally found a group of customers who was really changing the game. And we took that concept and we broadened it and we saw it work in every agency size across the board. People who got started yesterday, people who do it for 40 years and have big offices and hundreds of employees. It's just a better model. And so for me, it's just making sure that that model achieves critical mass, because I think the downline impact of that model actually is that the, the small business gets better outcomes for themselves than they would get in any other model because mm -hmm. they get the tools they need, which is great, but as, as important, they get someone who's competent, who cares about them, right? Who is really intent on finding them success using those tools. And you put those two things together and I think magic happens. And so for me, it's just, how do we get that model to critical mass? Mm -hmm. And when you say that, I think you mentioned to me one time, if you buy a similar software at a high level from, let's say the podium or the weaves of the world, you're going to get a, a salesman who makes a commission and never talks to you again. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, the traditional SaaS model and it doesn't, it's not even just our, our type of SaaS, right? It could be any, the, the traditional SaaS model is there's a sales team that sells you something. There's a support team that's there to support you. There's an onboarding team that's there to onboard you, but implicit behind all of that is like you're, we're going to get you going and then you're going to go and you're going to just keep paying us. And that is that. And really there's no caring behind that beyond that point, beyond that checklist, I think. And there's no room for anything else. So that's the other problem with this is that there's a sort of an implicit assumption that like the features inherent in the platform that you've bought are the only ones that you need, which A is not true. And then B, when you go to try to get that uh, sort of additional item or what, you know, could be a service. It could be, a, it could be something like the creative, it could be lots of things. Those people are like, Ooh, sorry. That's not like, Ooh, that's not, that's not us. Like you need to, yeah. Like go, go talk to somebody else. Right. Yeah. And that sucks for the business owner because they're like, wait, but I need that. Like that. I need a website designed in order to use the website builder or hosting or whatever. And they're like, uh, I don't know, go find somebody like, and that sucks. And so what I think we've done that's so fundamentally different is we've made it a one-stop shop. We've, we've said like, oh yeah, website builder, we got that. Oh, you need a website time? No problem. I can handle that. Or I have a team or blah, 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 blah. Point is, is I can solve that entire issue or for that need versus I can just provide you one piece and send you out a house for, for the rest. That That's what I think we're doing differently. Got it. So the model of high level, so traditional SaaS, what do you call your model, your business model? We call it SaaSpreneur, okay. <laughs> but you know what we we think of it as just the combining of SaaS and service. And then the other thing is is the revenue sharing, right? So one of the things I've long held as a belief, and I I would stand behind this today even, is that a lot of the tools that are in the Marcom stack, the marketing automation, CRM kind of stuff, their sales are very dependent actually on third parties. Call them agent. They could be agencies. They could be consultants. They could be many things. Basically, people out in the world recommending their product to others that they're working with. Mm. And I think that this is where a lot of these software companies sort of get it wrong. They don't see this sales channel. They don't appreciate it. And they certainly don't pay any money out to it. And what I like about our model is we try to hide behind the scenes. We don't want people to know we exist. We really want to create a revenue stream that goes directly to the agency. So that way, if the agency is out there getting success, they literally are not just getting it. They're, they're monetizing off of it. They're building a business off it. They're profiting off of it. And none of that has to trickle back to us. Yeah. What would you say to someone that says, you know, eventually all these agencies selling the exact same software, like it's just going to get saturated or people are going to be like, oh, I've seen this before. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I mean, it's hilarious, of course, because even on its face, you could say, well, what about every other platform that's been out there for a long time? But before we even go there, what I would always say is like, oh my gosh, you're just selling what we give you without any kind of modification, then you're high. Because the whole idea here is that we're a platform, we give you like a base layer, but because mm -hmm. you're a professional, remember the whole point here is that you know what you're doing, or you want to know, or you're going to learn, or you're going to have experience, you're going to add your expertise on top of it. And therefore it's never the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And you can go as, as shallow, or as deep as you want. And I still think create really amazing outcomes. I mean, at the end of the day, I think, you know, if all you knew how to do is white label it with your logo, but re and just get it installed and really just get installed like three features or one feature, even like you could create a truckload of value. And again, 
I don't think it's so much about the tool. It's about the outcome. So it's like, I tell people all the time, don't sell high level, sell what the business wants, like more five-star reviews, a higher rank on Google, more customers from the existing lead pool that they're already missing every day. All the website visitors that aren't transacting, all the phone calls that they're missing and, and that you could use missed call text back to, to turn into sales. Like those are the things that people care about anyways. They don't care like, oh, you have the same hammer as, you know, I've seen this hammer before at the store. I mean, that doesn't mean you go buy it and you can do anything with it. It's just a hammer for gosh sakes. If you don't know how to use it, who cares? Yeah, that's a great point. And what's your thought? Because there, the space has a lot of young people coming into it, you know, no training, being sold the idea of like, start a software company, start a marketing agency. Yeah. What's your thought on that side of it? With, with people that maybe don't have the expertise, but want to get in? Yeah. Again, I think it's totally scalable. And I don't think that you have to have the expertise. It's not about the have to have, it's about the willingness to get. Mm. So back to the original problem set, the business would, would say, it, we don't have time. What they're trying to say is like, given everything else that we're already doing, we're maxed out, like our day is done. That doesn't mean we don't want this stuff. It just means that we don't have any time here in our lives to learn this stuff. So if you're just getting in, what you're saying is, listen, maybe I don't know everything today, but I'm willing to learn, right? Again, I always say things like, even if you just did one feature, and I'm, I'm serious about that. I mean, like, and I always say the missed call text back feature is my favorite feature because yeah. it's super simple. You just say, listen, if you ever called a business and had them not call you back or they didn't pick up their phone and everyone's like, yeah, of course, that happens all the time. I'm like, well, great. Well, what if instead of them not picking up the phone, it texts you back and said, hey, would you like to book an appointment or get an estimate or whatever? What do you think would happen in that scenario? And I think most people would be thrilled and they would text back yes. And you could easily move that person down the line and get an estimate, right? Well, all that time, time that business owner on the other end is it doesn't have to be there they can be on the roof they can be you know it, you know uh, swinging the hammer in the house whatever they whatever they can be the dentist in in the mouth right but they're still bringing in that sale and so if all you're doing is learning that one thing you're creating enough value for that business to pay you for that platform every single month and you can just keep learning from there right I'm a big fan of that. I think it's very simple to do. And I don't think it's disingenuous. That's the other funny thing. Like just because you are doing something that someone else could do doesn't actually mean that you're doing anything wrong, right? We can all learn lots of stuff that we pay for every day to do. Like, you know, I could go to dental school. I'm certain of it. I have neighbors that are doctors. And I've met them. They are lovely people. But I, all, when I, I always say, it, I think to myself, you know, I could have been you. I could have gone to medical school. I didn't want to. But you're not like like a genius or anything. You're somebody who committed to a path. And so I think there's lots of situations in life where we pay people for things that we otherwise could do ourselves, but we just don't have time because we're doing something else. And that's okay. That's division of labor. There's nothing wrong with that. And so I would just say, if you want to get started, please do. There's no such thing as saturation. These business owners don't have time to do it. And they are willing to pay for the right price. They're willing to pay you to do it. And you can make a very scalable, nice business for yourself. Very cool. And so if, if you were starting an agency today, I assume it would be safe to say your answer is just go sell mixed call text back to local businesses. And yeah. Your... yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I have good proof of this. I mean, it, the only local business we are, uh, the only business that, uh, that we serve directly at high level on, on our own account is the HVAC guy that came and did my HVAC six, six years ago now, <laughs> who's been paying me $300 a month for the last six years. And we started with reputation management, but he does miss call text back now. I try, he never calls me. I try never to talk to him. I don't, because it, the, every time I've ever talked to him, he asked me to implement something that I don't want to implement because I'm not an agency. I tell him every time you need to get an agency. He did hire a full-time, but he's huge now. He has a full-time guy who just does marketing for him. So he essentially insourced it or whatever. But, um, you know, he and he doesn't, I mean, he's got, I don't know, 20 trucks or something now. He doesn't do HVAC himself anymore. But when I met him, it was two trucks. It was him and this other guy. And he did the, the HVAC himself. And he did a great job. And he did a fantastic job. And so I don't know. I just don't think it's rocket science. If I was starting an agency today, I would take one feature. I'd walk out my front door. That's the other thing. Walk out my front door. And I would use my home court advantage. I'd go serve the local businesses in town first. I wouldn't niche out. I don't believe in that. And I, I would tell you right there, you can build a very nice business that's doing hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue a year. And it doesn't limit you as well. So like if you're like hell bent on world domination, that's okay. Once you've sewn up any town USA, you can always go, you can go back online. You can run Facebook ads, you can do whatever. But reality is, is that local is the best place to start. And ironically, a lot of SaaS companies do this. Podium started locally and so did Patient Pop. Both of them walked themselves to about a million dollars in revenue 
literally walking around their local towns. And wow. you learn a lot, right? You learn how to talk to business owners. You learn what their pain points are. You build trust a lot easier than you can do at a distance. And so there's a lot of really great advantages there so that when you are ready for world domination, you'll have a lot of that already worked out. Very cool. Very cool. How have you found and maintained mentors or mentorship in your life? I'm pretty lucky. I mean, I have some really extraordinary people who use the platform. People who, while they may not be software titans, they're certainly marketing titans. And many of them are, to this day, uh, many leagues beyond where I'll ever get. And so I have the good fortune of the fact that they're willing to talk to me because they use high level. So I think what I've tried to do is learn a lot from them, not just about marketing, but about business, about life, and just seeing how they structure their lives, what, what they find important, what they think is coming around the bend. You know, software's a little hard. I, I tend to, there, there are very few people that are probably not in some way that I would talk to either a competitor or really more likely, if they're not a competitor, they're just doing the traditional model. So mm. it's sort of weird, right? Like I get in the room with these guys and they're like, and gals and they're super, like some run really big companies. And then I just tell them what we do. And I tell them that we're like profitable and things and none of it checks. It's just like deer in the headlights. They mm. just don't get it. And so it's hard to find mentors within kind of the traditional SaaS environment. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to build a sales team like these massive companies that just build? God, no. That sales sounds team? terrible. And no. why? I mean, I the place I see you very involved is the affiliates. Like you love paying those commissions. Like that is oh, absolutely. your sales team, right? How did you decide to go that route instead of building a, a sales team? Oh, we just lucked into it. So, you know, it's funny. I had a guy, I had like an analyst or something asked me last week, like how we figured out our pricing plan. And I said, oh, we just copied it from our competitor. And he just couldn't believe that. I, he's like, no, that's funny. That's no, but seriously. And I'm like, no, but seriously, that's, you know, no. I mean, sometimes things in life don't have to be so like, so concrete and planned out. And in fact, I would say almost never because it creates flexibility in your model. But what I would say is early on, what we knew about ourselves is that we were really good at product and engineering. And that means we weren't very good at other things like sales and marketing. And so we had to find a, we needed to find a method where we could, you know, we could have other people help us with that and and pay them for it, right? And that, cause that's the right thing to do. Um, and then what was great about that is while it's, it sort of started as a trickle, but we also then learned, like if, if you start to get a little bigger and more strategic and think about it, it's like, yeah, but gosh, sales teams are one-to-one, -one, but affiliates are one-to-many. So why is that such a bad deal? And then, you know, you sort of look over time and, you know, the costs are essentially the same, but the difference is, you know, the other thing I love about it is, you know, if you have a, a person in house who is a salesperson, you have to sit around every day and think, okay, God, uh, okay, what should they be selling? How should they sell it? How should they price it? How should they position it? That's a lot of work. And they, and if you don't do that, they just sit there and they look at you like, okay, you either better come up with all that stuff and make me successful. Or guess what? I'm going to go on to another sales job. Yeah. Affiliates, it's totally different. It, the creativity there is endless. And then you're just cutting the check and they wake up and they figure out how to make all that happen, right? Mm -hmm. It's a glorious model, in my opinion. And I think you could use it for almost anything. And I think people who don't do it are fools, but you know, that's probably what makes me unpopular at the SaaS Hangouts. Yeah, I think your affiliate program is is amazing. And it's there's just this thing of like, you can make more money than you spend on the software, like, duh. And, yeah. and well, everybody okay. wins that And way. actually, this isn't rocket science. We all know this inherently. Like we all tell our friends about things that we think are cool that we've recently either bought or discovered or whatever. Yeah. And that's all the, all the affiliate program really does is it says, hey, listen, you know that, that, sort of this, that software you just bought called High Level that you might have told your friends about anyways? Like here's an incentive to do it. What's lovely about it is it's really paying customers to do what it is that we know they would do to some extent naturally anyways. And so it's not like it's never disingenuous. It's not like I bought this really piece of crap software and now I'm <laughs> going to recommend it to my friends. No one ever does that, right? They yeah. wouldn't do it if it was garbage. It's just saying like, hey, remember us next time you're talking at to your friends at an event or to colleagues or whatever. And, it, and people have to bring their reputation to it. So it's it's very harmonious because if you go out and rep something that's total garbage, your reputation gets torn to shreds. So no one does it just because we pay them. They do it because they believe in the product as much as they get an affiliate commission. Yeah, love that. What are the core values of high level? Gosh, we haven't written down someplace, but my versions are, you know, always be customer first. And, and I hate core values in general because they always tend to be like corny, yeah. but it, it truly is like, but we did have to write them down because people asked. So it is a, it is customer first, be action oriented and, and move directionally. 
<laughs> so that last one seems to really be difficult for a lot of people because what it means is it means that you need to act in absence of exact or complete information. And mm. I think this is really important because what you often get is people will sort of sit around and wait for every last data point. And if you learn in life that, you know, there's only, you, you can get to a very good amount of data that gives you sort of directional accuracy. So it's like, you know, go east, right? Like where east? I don't know, but just head east. East mm -hmm. is the good direction. It's out east somewhere, right? Or whatever. Like that's the type of stuff that just like most people can't handle. In business, it's critical. So that is one of the hardest things to teach people because they'll want, you know, 800,000 rows in the spreadsheet and they'll want to know it's 100% of the data and they'll want six months to analyze it and all this other crap. When a thousand rows and two days worth of an, you know analysis can tell you 80% of what you need to know. And, right. you know, it doesn't mean don't fill it in better later and yada, yada, but, but for God's sakes, don't stand around and do nothing waiting for this sort of perfect world to emerge. Yeah. Last question for you. Why does helping small businesses matter to you? Uh, small businesses are are the best. <laughs> large businesses suck. I mean, small businesses, if you just look at the facts, I mean, they pay better than large businesses. They care more about, they're, they're better stewards of their communities. So they're, they're more likely to do mm. things that on their face sound stupid, but, you know, have a big impact on the world, you know, sponsor the Little League team or clean up the trash on the side of the highway or, and they do things not because they think they're going to get some tax break or some, you know, I don't know, some news story about them. They just do it because they think it's like the right thing to do. Forget all that. They're, they're just hands down more innovative because they have, you know, it's a super simple idea. When you get to the top of the hill, you know, you suddenly stop caring about innovation because you're at the top of the hill. So now it's just like, I'm going to keep everybody down the hill for me. That's my goal. Right. Mm -hmm. And what is that about? Is that about taking risk? No, that's crazy. Who would take risk? I'm at the top of the hill. So that just means do whatever it takes to stay here, get rid of competition. Like it leads to really crappy ways of being versus smaller companies. They have nothing to lose. So they're like, crazy idea. That's for me. Let's try it. And you know, most of those fail, but but the ones that succeed change the world. And so without lots of small companies, you're not going to get to those innovative ideas. You're going to get just get a bunch of people at the top of the hill kind of sucking wind, trying to hold the hill and keep competition away. And they just, they'll do whatever they can within reason or within the law or within what they think they can get away with. And that's just a terrible world to live in. Yeah. Very cool. I love it, Sean. Thanks so much for your time. And yeah, man. Thanks for having me. In here that'll help to, uh, yeah. tons of people. Hopefully, hopefully somebody learned something. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Take All right, care. my friend. Bye have for fun. now.